Welcome to Black Hat Briefings 2001, held July 11 through the 12th in Las Vegas, Nevada. This is videotape number 26, Computer Forensics, a critical process in your incident response plan. We're going to have uh, Greg Miles do computer forensics. Greg is a principal in JAWS Technologies as well as Security Horizons. He's been in the field for about 14 years. I hope you enjoy today's topic. Thank you. Thank you, Jack. Good morning, and I appreciate you coming to listen to this topic. It's been an ever-expanding subject in the last few years within information security, and that's how do you deal with evidence and computer, you know, the computer forensics side. So what we're going to talk about is computer forensics after we do a quick introduction to in incident response. And this will be a review, I think, for a, a great number of you, but we'll get everybody on the same playing field as we move along. Uh, first thing I'd like to do is to conduct a survey, and that's always dangerous because you never know if the survey is going to end up like you like it to, but we're going to do it anyhow. So if you'll help me out here with a show of hands, how many of you work in some capacity for the government? Okay, thank you. How many of you work at companies that have greater than 1,000 employees? Thank you. How many of you work at companies that have between 500 uh, and 1,000 employees? How many of you work in companies with less than 50 employees? Okay. So there's large representation from large organizations here. Um, Let's see, how many of your organizations have incident response teams? Very good. How many of you are part of the incident response teams? Wow, very good. And how many of you are the incident response team? <laughs> That's what I thought. <laughs> okay, how many of you have computer forensics experience? Okay, a smaller number, but a few. Great. Thank you very much for participating in that survey. Your results will be published. No, just kidding. <laughs> Here's my contact information. I'll be happy to answer any questions here, after the sessions, or via email, uh, or phone calls. Um, I've got some cards with me as well, if you'd like to have them afterwards. Uh, I am the Director of Cybercrime Response for JAWS, Inc. Uh, if you've never heard of JAWS, please check us out. Um, with Cybercrime response, we're responsible for incident response, computer forensics, and training uh, for our JAWS customers. I'm also the chief operating officer for Security Horizon, which we've traditionally been an information portal uh, for publishing thoughts, ideas, articles, etc. And you can check out our white paper section at Security Horizon. Get the computer to wake up. We'll be in good shape. All right. Uh, what we're going to cover is incident response, just a quick overview. Computer forensics, we're going to try to define that. Um, contemporary issues, the forensics process, forensics tools, forensics problems, and the future. <laughs> incident response. Why is incident response critical? It's because you want to be able to resolve the problem. You want to be able to find out what happened, how it happened, and who did it. And the who did it is the hardest thing you can try to find out. Um, you really want to create good documentation, records. You want to be able to do uh, trend analysis. You want to do process improvement. Uh, you want to av avoid confusion as you work through the process. What are the elements of incident response? There's six major areas that are widely accepted. So we'll keep it simple and keep it within those six major areas. Preparation. And we'll hit each of these in a moment. Identification, containment, eradication, recovery, and follow-up. Okay, preparation. The most important thing you can do is be prepared for an incident. If you do not have an incident response plan, or at least some way to access a, a group of people that can help you do incident response, there's going to be confusion, there's going to be mistakes made, you're going to contaminate any evidence that you might have been able to use to find and hopefully ultimately uh,
prosecute whoever has done the incident to your system. Uh, we're still in the realm of, we've, in the past we've talked 80% internal, 20% external, and I think it's starting to lean more toward the 70% internal um, threat as opposed, and 30% external threat as, uh, as kind of a rule of thumb. So you're still talking about both internal and external when you're dealing with incident response. If somebody screws up your system, you've still got to respond to it, whether it was done by an internal or an external person. But preparation is the most important. Identification is probably the most difficult part of an incident response process. A system anomaly can be overlooked in terms of interpreting as a computer incident. Um, it could be a hardware, fa hardware failure, a hard drive failure, um, any kind of system failure, BIOS problems, or it could be the fact that you got hacked and somebody has placed programs in your system. Uh, things that'll slow down your system, et cetera, and we'll hit a few of those in a moment. But it is a very difficult process. But any anomaly you notice, you should investigate. Okay, how do you, who can identify an incident? Basically anybody from your users to your system support personnel, you can get, uh, your customers can identify issues. Um, just as an example to, to pick on my own company, JAWS, for a moment, we had an, an incident where our website is linked to a news service that does all of our, uh, you know, press releases and they keep them up. Well, it was noticed by one of our customers that there was a, uh, some very foul words on our press releases uh, through the website. And so once we did our investigation of it, we found that it was linked to the new service and the new service had gotten hacked and all of their press releases on their system were uh, done, it was a poison box attack and it was uh, very foul language, which is not good for companies to have on their website. So uh, those kinds of things happen and it is impossible to 100% protect your system. So that's why incident response is so important. You've got to have a plan in place because there's a good chance that you're going to get hit. Okay, some incident classifications. This is not all encompassing. These are just some options you can have out there. Um, there's about three pages of them here, but you know, an unauthorized privileged access, that's root administrator uh, access. Somebody that shouldn't have it has gotten it, whether it be internal or external. Um, unauthorized limited uh, access, meaning that if you have a user that has uh, gained privileges that they should not, or that a non-user has gotten user privileges through whether they stole a password or somebody gave out their passwords, et cetera. Um, an authorized unsuccessful attempted access is another one. An unauthorized probe. A uh, very wide ranging one here, poor security practices. Uh, anywhere from bad, <laughs> bad passwords, um, direct privilege logs logins, and uh, you generally can monitor these through, these through your network. Denial of service attacks is another classification. Malicious logic, anywhere viruses, worms, etc. Hardware and software failure. Infrastructure fa failure, which includes you know power failures, floods, that kind of thing. And uh, unauthorized utilization of services. This is, could include using corporate systems or government systems to play games, um, to put a modem on the back of your machine when you should never do that. You only need, you know, ha should have controlled entry points to your system, et cetera. Okay, the third element is containment. And basically with containment, what you're trying to do is you're trying to limit the scope and the magnitude of the incident. And as soon as you recognize that something is going on, you should take steps toward the containment, whether you're disconnecting it from the network, whether you're able to cut over to a hot spare, um, you know, et cetera. You're, you're trying to really control and keep a hand around how extensive your incident can be. Malicious code is a very common one that comes about. 
Um, viruses are easily, viruses, worms, et cetera, are easily promulgated. And uh, it's not uncommon that when you have a virus or a worm that it's going to promulgate to all of your systems or a large number of your systems that are connected together. So you've really got to be able to control and contain when those things kinds of, kinds of things happen. And just as an example, you can, uh, and these probably aren't as current as they need to be, but if you look at from 1988 to present, in 1988, the first incident of an internet worm um, was experienced, and it attacked about 6,000 computers in a day, and that was huge at that time. Uh, the love bug virus, which is a little more recent, um, affected over 10 million computers and billions of dollars worth of damage. The total amount is unknown because it's not known how many systems had to be replaced, how much time was spent on repairing the systems, those kinds of things. And uh, the effects of the cornucopia worm, uh, same deal. I'm sure it's going to be quite expensive. Uh, the Melissa virus is another one that uh, we're all familiar with. So can be very expensive. Where do you get your damage estimates from? Uh, the question was, where do we get our damage estimates from? It pulled it off some news services, uh, CNN and, uh, what's this, C CBN, I think, is the other one. The, my understanding is the numbers that they have, and I, I can't speak to their techniques for providing the data, is that uh, they're getting reports from the different companies um, to the different areas. So, yeah. Okay, the next step, the fourth step, is eradication. And uh, what you're trying to do with eradication is trying to remove the cause of the incident. You know, with, for viruses, we all know about antivirus software. If it's a new virus, you've got to work with the virus companies in order to let them know and try to create uh, solutions to those new viruses. Uh, you can do things with your firewalls. You can do things with your uh, intrusion detection systems and various other methods to try to block that kind of traffic. And uh, basically, really, what you're trying to do ultimately, if that is your goal as an organization, is to, to bust the people that are doing this. Um, if it is a mistake internal, you know, there's methodologies and there's processes that uh, you use with your HR. If it's external yeah, and it's malicious and intentional, you want to uh, do the things you need to do to stop it and uh, hopefully to uh, take them to court. Recovery, th just basically the process of returning your system to normal operation. And uh, with unsuccessful incidences, uh, and an incident can be a knock on the door, or an incident can be a full-blown, they blow your door off. Uh, basically, what you want to make sure that you review what has happened and that you take the steps necessary to help protect yourself in the future. So if it's an unsuccessful incident, you're going to review your processes, you're going to make sure things are still solid, um, or look at do you need to put other measures in place. If you're, if you got the door blown off, basically, then you've got to take some major steps to make sure you have clean systems and that you're not using backups that ha have been damaged in the past, et cetera. So you just got to take some basic steps, cautious steps, to make that happen. Follow-up, very critical. And this is where a lot of incident response fails. You successfully bring your system back to recovery, but you don't do the follow-up that helps yourself prepare for the next one. So it is extremely critical. You're looking to improve your incident handling procedures. You're looking to address how, if, and why you want to prosecute the perpetrator that might have uh, affected your system. And you're going to analyze the incident and the response that you did. You're going to analyze the cost and record the cost associated with that incident because cost is critical in a legal environment in order to, to look at the level of uh, charges that can be placed against somebody. You, obviously, you're going to do your documentation, prepare a report, and uh, if necessary, you're going to revise your policies and procedures based on the things that have happened. Okay, that was a fairly quick overview of incident response and the six major areas that are associated with it. Now we're going to hit the computer forensics side. What is computer forensics? 
Basically, computer forensics is the, excuse me? <laughs> it's, computer forensics is, is very technical, and I, I bet a great number of you in the room have good technical experience associated with you know, instant response, computers, security, et cetera. But what computer forensics is, is really the application of that, but to include the legal side of it. Um, with computer forensics, you are looking at not only the technical, but you're also looking at how do you maintain chain of custody, how do you maintain the credibility and integrity of your evidence, and how do you con continue on toward the uh, prosecution side of it, keeping everything within the legal environment. Why is evidence important? In the legal world, evidence is everything. You can be the greatest technician in the world, but if there's question as to the integrity of the evidence, it's going to be useless in a court of law. So there's certain things you need to understand and steps you need to take within the legal realm in order to be able to, con to go to court with this information. Evidence is used to establish the facts of the case. Evidence is supposed to be totally emotionless, so totally objective. And the forensics examiner cannot be biased. Uh, they cannot be looking to nail somebody. They need to be looking at the facts based on the case or the situation. Who needs computer forensics? The victim, whether it be a company or an individual. Law enforcement is going to need that for uh, their purposes. Insurance carriers for due diligence purposes. They're going to need to know whether companies are taking the right steps uh, to protect their systems and whether to go after the perpetrator themselves as the insurance company. And ultimately the, the full legal system and judicial system, um, whether you're in the U.S., Canada, or whatever country you're from. And who are the victims? Public businesses? private business, government, private individuals. Okay, the next three shots are just screen captures of some fairly recent things that have happened and it, uh, you can see it in the news, at least on a weekly basis, that there's some news about hacking or some site got hacked or some group is doing something, et cetera. But here's some examples that affect each and every one of us. Uh, hospitals, in terms of patient information and protection of that patient information. This is where things have been taken uh, by uh, hackers. Vulnerabilities to hacking access, and you know, these are our uh, some of our uh, communications and law enforcement uh, agencies within the U.S. And then vulnerabilities as well in terms of, uh, you know, telecommuting, home workers, et cetera. Those kinds of doors can be opened if there's not good education and not good processes and procedures within each company um, in terms of trying to protect, uh, especially during, you know, dial-up situations where you're uh, working at home, et cetera. So. And with the advent of cable modems, wireless broadband, and uh, multiple other high-speed uh, networks, this problem just compounds. Why do you do a forensics analysis? You want to identify the perpetrator. You want to identify the methods and the vulnerabilities in the network that the perpetrator may have used to gain access to the system. You want to conduct a damage assessment, and that goes along with your financial situation as well, plus your recovery. And you want to preserve evidence. Okay, there are five types of computer forensics that uh, are commonly referred to, and there's probably even more than this, but these are the ones we're going to refer to. Uh, disk forensics, this is basically looking at you know, floppy drives, hard drives, CD-ROMs, et cetera, looking in them for uh, data that may be evidence for the purposes of uh, prosecution or just purposes of finding out what the heck was going on. And you might find that in, uh, in active files, deleted files, um, as well as Slack space, 
uh, and those different areas uh, within the computer. And uh, file identification is an example. That's how the Melissa virus was uh, identified. Computer, or excuse me, network forensics. And basically, you're looking at the network traffic, and you're trying to, to uh, determine what methods are being used within the network and to uh, to attack it. And this can be done either passively. Um, after the fact, through the logs uh, and through various tools you might put in there, and can be done actively through sniffers and real-time monitoring. Email forensics, um, this can often be the Achilles heel for uh, you know, different aspects like uh, sexual harassment, et cetera, for uh, purposes of prosecution. This is where people think if they delete their email, it's gone. It's not in general. Um, Unless, of course, you're 97% full, like a lot of uh, email servers are becoming this d these days uh, for purposes of just operations. Internet forensics, this is basically looking at how and, and when and where did people go on the Internet. This is often used for pornography, child pornography, uh, various other aspects uh, to determine where people have been at on the Internet. And source code forensics, very complicated uh, type of forensics. Um, you're basically using this to determine actual ownership of source code, whether it has been stolen or uh, just slightly revised, and you, know, you have copyright issues or, or those kinds of things. And it's, uh, it's a process as well. It's just not the technical review of the code. It's also all the procedures and processes that are used by the various companies that can be used in order to determine those kinds of aspects. If you look at technical progress that we've had over the last few years, um, and I think this is becoming clear, you know, 20 years ago, having a home computer was, it was heard of, it was very expensive, and all you're getting was like a, an 8086 processor that worked at, you know, three bits per hour that went across the system. Uh, networking was not really that popular, especially personal networking. And as we progressed over the last 20 years, we've got into such technical speeds uh, and high quality processes and high quality technology that uh, it's made uh, computer forensics that much more important as we've gone along. The world is networked. We are we have a network here at a conference, and it's wireless. And just think of the implications of security for that. Um, I've hooked to it uncomfortably uh, while here, and I'm sure most of you are at least thinking about security if you're running your wireless uh, LAN. I stay on it as little as possible. So those are kinds of things that you think about until you really understand what the security is, is in place there. Um, use of encryption that is becoming more and more uh, easily available and affordable through like PGP and RSA and those various different uh, types of encryption. And you can encrypt entire hard drives that, you know, people can hopefully never encrypt if they're the, the bad guys and hopefully you don't forget your password so you can get back into them again. Network bandwidth is increasing uh, greatly and the cost is being reduced, uh, you know, wireless broadband and even T1s are getting fairly cheap. Uh, massive OC12s plus uh, are out there for uh, bandwidth transmission. And even the media is becoming much less expensive. Uh, I can buy a 40 gigabyte hard drive for you know, $99 through uh, PriceWatch or through you know, one of the companies on PriceWatch. It's getting dirt cheap. Albert Einstein said it well, uh, technology to technological progress is like an ax in the hands of a pathological criminal. Um, technology is good, but technology can be used for negative aspects. Okay, computers, excuse me, computers can be tools and they can be targets. Um, they are, they can be an instrument of a crime. They can be a document repository of a crime. Um, many computer or many criminals today are getting very technical 
and uh, even organized to the point where they become dependent upon computers in order to do their crimes. And that can be either through, you know, whether they're actually hacking something or whether they're just using it to, to maintain um, information about their customers and drug deals or about uh, the other activities that they do. Uh, inventory that they may have, you know, they got 60 M16 rifles uh, hanging around someplace or that kind of thing. Um, computer crime today, uh, it is, the aura is considered as a crime without punishment. It, there's a lot of anon anonymity with that, <laughs> anonymity, something like that. Um, basically, you can do it and you think people don't know who you are. And it's, it's sensationalized by the media. Um, we see that, we saw that in the, uh, the different articles that we had and we also see it in the news, uh, especially when you get into situations like Kevin Mitnick and others that are out there. Um, public apathy and then it is fairly easy to commit. What is cybercrime? It's basically where technology plays a role in a crime. A computer can be the target of an attack, it can be a tool used in an attack, and it can be used s to store data related to the criminal activity. Types of cybercrime, I'm not gonna read these all, but uh, it can be very much related to, tra to traditional crime, just use of technology within the traditional crime. Basically, with the judicial system, it has not been well prepared to handle technological crime, to handle cyber crime. Um, historically, they've used traditional crime laws in order to prosecute, prosecute cyber crime. There are efforts in place to try to change that, but it is a long process and it requires a great deal of education of our legislators and uh, our legal system in order to be able to make that happen. There is a tremendous shortage in trained investigators and analysts. And there's a lack of forensic standards. There is just too much data. Um, in order to cover a gig hard drive just on basic, ana basic analysis, you know, you're looking at hours upon hours of effort depending on what tools you're using and what methods you're using to try to find that. But there are things that uh, are in place that can help and there's some tools we'll talk about in a few minutes. And then of course there's always the issues relating to time. Okay, we're coming upon the t-shirt question. Who can tell me what the Fourth Amendment is? I heard it first over here. There's your shirt, thank you. <laughs> uh, it was an easy question, but just make sure you're awake. <coughs> okay, there's, there's uh, some acts out there that try to help protect um, the U.S. citizens from being, you know, spied on by the government. And two of them we're going to talk about, you know, one is obviously the Fourth Amendment. And uh, the Fourth Amendment basically says that you will not uh, unrightfully search and seize things from citizens without probable cause. And that's where our search warrants come into place, et cetera. The other one is the Electronic Communications Privacy Act, mm -hmm. and it prohibits all monitoring of wire, or wire oral, and electronic communications unless uh, there it meets specific expectations. And that may include email, keystroke monitoring, network monitoring, pin registers, dial number recorders, et cetera. There are some exceptions, however. If you give consent or implied consent, then the exception is in place. That's why bannering of your systems and networks are so important because if, if you force people coming to your system that, that ban and that banner's in place and they have read it and ignored it, then they've given implied consent for monitoring. And that's the same for with your, uh, you're working at your workstation at work. You know, improper use of this system is 
is inappropriate or whatever legal thing you put in place for that, but banners are extremely important. And service provider exception can monitor, disclose, and use communication in the normal process of their business. So if they have to monitor their networks in order to keep them alive and working, and they run across this stuff, that's an exception as well that, that meets the criteria. Let's talk about entrapment for just a second since we're on this legal conversation. <coughs> entrapment is an act by law enforcement offer, officer to induce a person to commit a crime that the person has not previously contemplated. Okay, then we get into the discussion about honeypots. Well, the argument is that a honeypot is not entrapment because it is a tool to help tool to help identify an intruder. It is not a invitation for somebody to do crime. Um, a hacker challenge, on the other hand, uh, is probably a uh, entrapment situation. If a law enforcement has disguised themselves as a group and they invite people to come in and hack them, that's probably entrapment. I am not a lawyer. Any questions you have about legal stuff, you definitely got to talk to a lawyer. Okay, the forensics process. There are five basic steps in the forensics process. Preparation, protection, imaging, examination, and document, <coughs> excuse me, documentation. Again, preparation for computer forensics is as important as preparation for incident response. In the preparation uh, process, you're going to confirm that you have the authority to do the analysis and search the media that you have. If you're a private company, um, based on your company rules and regulations, you can execute that. If it's going to be a legal investigation, then you're talking about warrants um, and those kinds of things. So you need to keep that in mind. And you're going to try to clearly define the purpose of the exam uh, analysis or the purpose of the search that you're doing. With that in mind, you're going to be able to narrow down your search topics that you're going to be looking for, the kinds of things you're going to be looking for, whether it be deleted files, whether it be uh, photo images of, you know, for child pornography or whatever. You've got to clearly define what it is you're looking for. And you've got to assure that you're using sterile media. Um, and what that means is you've got to make sure that you're n using current, virus-free, uncontaminated copies of, of software. So generally, if, if you consistently do computer forensics, you're going to reload your machines with known credible copies of things every time you do one. You're going to clean off hard drives, not just delete files, but you're going to realign all the bits to, uh, to get rid of all the old data et cetera. And there's training courses and various things that you can do to, to help you learn that if you have an interest in going to computer forensics, um, et cetera. So. <coughs> and you want, excuse me, you want to make sure that the tools that you're utilizing can be used and accepted in a court of law. Um, you may have to explain how a tool works whether it be an in case or an S tools or, or et cetera, to to a un or a non technical juror in a court of law, if you're going to become a uh, expert witness and that kind of thing, so you've really got to take a a good look and have a good understanding of the tools that you're using. Okay, just uh, continue on with the legal side. Employer search, employer searches in the private sector workplaces. Basically, a warrantless workplace search is okay. It does not violate the Fourth Amendment, Amendment if the company is not acting as an agent of the government. And basically what that means is if the company calls law enforcement and says, I have uh, reason to believe I have a somebody that is doing something wrong with, him, with my company. And if the law enforcement agency says, won't you monitor them and give us the evidence, okay, they've just become an agent of, uh, of the government or of law enforcement, and then that would be uh, a, a real problem without a warrant. 
to be able to do that. But as a company, you can monitor your employees and um, you know keep track of the, the various activities they're doing on the network. I, and those have to be guided by your company policies. And certainly get your legal counsel involved with those company policies associated with that. Like I said, consult your legal counsel. Protection. You have to protect the integrity of the evidence. And you have to maintain control from the time that the incident has happened to the time that it is closed out. So you're going to take a piece of the evidence, whether it be a hard drive, a disk, or whatever, and you're going to have to track every step of the way, who touches it, who does what with it, um, et cetera. And you're going to have to make sure it's secure, and you have to make sure it's locked away. When you're dealing with computer forensics, excuse me, if you're taking a machine, for example, uh, a laptop or a desktop machine, you want to disconnect your hard drives before you ever turn it on. Um, in a couple minutes, we'll go through kind of a when an incident happens type of scenario, um, what not to do, which is just as important as what to do uh, with that. But you want to make sure that you don't ever boot to that original evidence, because if you do, you've contaminated the evidence. And there are some tools out there um, that can help lock the hard drives so it does not, or the drives themselves, so it does not change the uh, last access date, um, the write date, et cetera, for any of the files. Imaging. Okay, disk imaging is a, a, a bit for bit copy of a disk, a CD, a hard drive. Uh, it is not a file copy because that's only active files. Bit for bit copies everything. Slack space, swap space, it copies uh, deleted files, it copies hidden files, and, and also the active files. And very critical, once you have your piece of evidence in your hand, you never ever use that to analyze. You do the image and you do all your analysis on the image of the drive. You want to maintain that original evidence in its original state. Then you're going to look at examining it. You're going to look at what operating systems it's running, what services were running, what applications and processes were running, hardware, uh, log files, system security applications, file systems, et cetera. You're going to be looking at deleted files, hidden files, uh, NTFS streams, software, encryption software, published shares, permissions that are out there, password files, SIDs, uh, network architecture, trusted relationships. Those are just, I, I went through them very quickly on purpose. There's the only way you can learn to do computer forensics is by getting trained in it and then practicing uh, extensively with it. Uh, but those are the different kinds of things that you're going to be looking at when you're doing your analysis. You also need to keep in mind, okay, what about off-site types of things? You know, a lot of us have F drives or X drives or Y drives or multiple access uh, through shared uh, systems internal to the, to the different companies or organizations that we're involved with. And you also got to consider, you know, your FTP, your FTP logs and links and um, and the different shares that are on the internal networks of your, your victim, I guess, in this case. The documentation stage. Okay, documentation in evidence, and especially evidentiary control, is essential. Uh, without having that prop those proper things in place, again, your evidence can be thrown out or just be considered to be not reliable in a court of law. You have to make sure you document your reasons for the examination. You document what you found when you get there, at the scene. And you can utilize um, screen capture and copy and of the suspect files, et cetera. And you want to make sure you know what applications um, and document what applications are used for analysis and for uh, recording the uh, the reports for the system. 
Okay, some of the forensics tools that we're gonna talk about here. Now we're gonna look at the, the toolkit, the computer systems, and the software. Okay, just some pictures. And, and each forensics analyst is probably gonna develop their own toolkit for the things they need. But this you know, just shows some different things. You might need a magnet, because you could drop, as you're working within a system, you, you, know, you sometimes drop uh, screws and bolts and that kind of thing in there. Of course, never get the magnet too close to your data, or that'll mess things up. But <laughs> that's only for, <laughs> forget the magnet thing. Don't even bother. <coughs> um, <laughs> <laughs> you might you might need a mirror to get in behind things, especially if you're dealing in a criminal case. You need to be very cautious when you're uh, messing with the system. You might want to look for booby traps. You might want to look for things that might have been added, connected to a system um, in case somebody came in and seized their system. Uh, it could be C4 packed inside of a box. It could just be for, uh, some basic power uh, surge they have implemented that'll fry hard drives so you never access it again. So you know, you, you've got to really be conscious of what you're looking at when you do that kind of thing. Uh, but that goes along with the law enforcement training, uh, search and seizure more than it does just the computer forensics. Uh, and then other tools, you know, you never know when a fork might be handy. And uh, anti-air gloves to, to protect the systems you're touching. And extremely critical is anti-static uh, wristbands or something to help dissipate static so you don't fry the system before you ever, ever have a chance to look at it. Okay, you, you need to define what systems are you likely going to be using, what systems do you want to have in your inventory. You ha you're looking at um, a large number of Pentium-based systems are out there today, uh, and so you're, you're definitely going to be looking at a high-end system there. Uh, you may also want to look at Unix boxes. You may want to look at, uh, you know, a Mac if you think you're going to have a lot of that. Uh, luckily, some of the tools are starting to be able to do multiple operating systems. And again, we'll hit that in just a second. Um, it, you know, the common operating systems that are out there is Unix, Windows, um, Mac, some uh, Linux on Pentium machines is a Unix-based type of. Uh, operating system as well. Your media options, um, you know, the, the removal media, the removable hard drives, uh, CDs, all that kind of stuff. You're going to need uh, good systems to do your, your uh, forensics analysis. They also make machines that will do imaging for you. Um, it will do bit, the bit-by-bit bit copy. All you do is you plug it in to uh, the box, and the example was the Image Masters, and I think there's even some newer versions uh, out that'll do more, better, and great things. Um, and there's a picture of that coming up here shortly. Uh, again, static dissipative grounding kits, wrist straps to protect yourself, and uh, uninterruptible power supplies, because if you're in the middle of an analysis and your power goes out, <laughs> it's not a good thing. And you should have room for an ex expansion. Um, likely there's going to be new technologies that come out and uh, you're going to need a way to expand that. SCSI is one way, more stuff is becoming IDE as well. You've got to make sure you have multiple types of media uh, in terms of hard drives. Uh, you got to make sure you have hard drives big enough to put and transfer and image things to. Um, tape drives and dat, uh, dat tape drives as well are good ways to do the imaging, uh, to have it on media. Uh, and then you restore it back to a hard drive or whatever uh, in the near future. CD-ROMs, uh, CD writers, and DVDs, again, you have to have in your system. Removable hard drives, zip drives, jazz drives, flash drives, unnamed drives, you know, all those good things that are coming out. Um, you need to stay on top of that because you're likely to encounter them in your analysis. Okay, the disk imaging hardware that we talked about just a few moments ago. Um, this is, again, just a, a picture of what we had talked about. Some of them do just one disk to one disk. Some can do one to four. And what that does, it lets you either use, uh, spread 
your images to multiple examiners looking for specific things or you can you know whatever your process is you can define how you're going to use those for but then you lock away the original evidence because that is your ticket to success um, it does not matter with these image drivers what or imaging machines what operating system you're working as long as it'll plug in to that box it'll then image that drive um, it, and this box does not run an operating system or anything it's just copying the bits back and forth okay when you're dealing with software in the forensics analysis you want to make sure that you're working from clean operating systems and we discussed that a few minutes ago you want to make sure you do an original load or you have a verified undamaged unscrewed up um, image that you can copy over each time you just uh, whether you do it through hash values or whatever you just want to make sure it's it has not changed from its original state um, you want to make sure you have good disk image backup software um, soft search and recovery utilities file viewing utilities um, you may need cracking software for passwords and you may need archive and compression utilities you want to validate your software you want to make sure it's operating correctly uh, that in your documentation you verify that it is operating correctly and that you identify the limitations of the software and you identify any known bugs because that can bite you in a court if you don't identify that and the uh, defendant's attorney does and you testify on your own experience if you ever go to court with it disk imaging software um, we're not talking about the picture we saw where the disks were sitting on this box we're now talking about software running on a computer that does the imaging for you and again it it has to be bit level copy bit by bit copy um, the different software that we uh, have listed here at the bottom the NCASE, the safeback and snapback there they run on windows but they can copy uh, multiple operating systems um, Unix is a uh, actually has been identified the, the Linux utilities that they have have been identified as a good way to do disk imaging um, as to its validity in, in court I can't talk to that I don't know um, and that's the key the, with uh, with the Linux it's not so much it's not as controlled since it's an open source software where with these these can be verified very easily so you need to, if you go to court you need to be able to at least talk how the products work and why you chose those products if you choose to use Linux just be prepared to explain why it was chosen and any known limitations and bugs that might go along with it that is that is an individual's choice or it's a individual or corporation's choice or law enforcement's choice as to what products they want to use to do that you just have to back it up corners to toolkit uh, actually I heard yesterday there's a new version that's out that I have not tested uh, that is a, another tool uh, that is out there I think it's on the slide coming up as well okay yeah and people that have been involved with computer forensics they Ha and have sp experience and c are comfortable with certain tools hey, you know as long as you can back it up you know that's uh, that's going to work for you okay the fr actual forensics analysis software that that I'm familiar with is uh, in case and corners toolkit there are also law enforcement products that are out there that are not supposed to be publicly available uh, to do different types of analysis so um, these are the ones that are available to the commercial side and they can do DOS Windows NT Windows NT 98 2000 etc and Unix and Norton uh, utilities also is good for recovering hidden files recovering uh, various other activities so Norton is a good thing to have in your toolkit as well 
indicate file viewing, this is uh, kind of important as well. Um, if you have a file that is a Word document and you're doing analysis on that and you want to open it up, as soon as you open it up, you've changed the last access date of that file. That's bad <laughs> in, in evidentiary purposes. So there's products out there that will not change the access date of the files, and this is just an example of those. Okay, when you're talking about uh, the forensics analysis process, you're going to, you want to lock the disk, you want to make sure you cannot write anything to that disk, um, whether it be hard drive, there are hard drive locking tools. Um, if it's a floppy disk, you can lock that. If it's a CD, in general, it's self-locked, unless it's uh, rewritable, and then uh, you just have to be cautious as the processes you take. <coughs> you, t you take the image of the drive, uh, you do a file system authentication, and you list the directories and file systems. This is going to end up being on your report. Uh, you're going to look for hidden and obscured data, and then uh, look at your, your cluster analysis. Okay, in terms of system authentication, there's uh, three primary ones that, that are in use that I'm aware of, and that's um, the cyclic redundancy check. Uh, it's a 32-bit type of check. It basically what it does is it creates a number for you based on running itself against your drive or your file, depending on how you've done that. And then you can use that then to verify that throughout the process that file has not changed or that disk has not changed. Uh, in case does that for you, it's a good product to do that because uh, when you first acquire it, it creates a hash value. And then throughout the process, you can show that that hash value has not changed. It's a one-way hash, so you cannot you know, reinterpret it back to, to try to be flaky with it. So, and, and the more bits you do it with, the more integrity there is with the hash value. And I'm not a mathematician, so I can't go through what it really means. But Okay. Basically, you're when you're dealing with disk forensics, hard drive forensics, um, creating your reports, you're going to break it out to, uh, to show your, your tree, your hierarchical structure. Um, you're going to identify the files that you think may be suspect. Um, you're going to inventory all files that are on the disk. You're going to search uh, for communications programs that either have been implanted in the system for purposes or, or things that are in the system that the, the criminal has used in order to do various activities. Uh, you're going to look at the registry files to see if there's still some things in there that have uh, been hidden, uh, maybe deleted programs, but there's still registry indications that those programs are on there. Um, the last file is accessed, assessed, and then you're going to uh, do a document association. And another thing you're going to be looking at, too, is um, file signatures. And you're going to be looking to see if uh, any files were changed, if the file signature was changed intentionally, uh, or the file names and extensions. You can search based on certain characteristics within these different programs. Um, you do keyword search. You can do file extension searches. Uh, you can search specifically on hidden files, deleted files, etc. Hidden, hidden files. Basically, you've you've uh, well, Word or Windows actually lets you hide files intentionally. Um, Linux, uh, Unix will let you do that as well. Uh, it lets you do it for dir directories. Um, many times, temporary directories are hidden. Then you have things that hide in uh, Slack space and unallocated space and swap space, and people that are good at hiding stuff can hide you know, at the ends of end of extensions and files. And then steganography, which is basically the art of hiding data or hiding communications. Uh, you know, encryption conceals it. Steganography just denies that it even exists. You can hide files within images. I mean, images within images, or files within images, various other things. And there's this thing called S-tools, 
that actually does it. And this is just a, an example of a, a baby's picture that has another picture hidden inside of it. And uh, the actual tool will do that for you. Okay, ghosting is another aspect of things that you'd be looking for. And, and ghosting can be done in many different ways. This is just one example where you have white letters on white paper or on white background, and when you see it, it looks like a blank document, but when you actually look at what's there, you know, it says something. Um, and that's just a basic function of ghosting. And the nice thing about Encase and uh, some of the other tools, uh, and I, the viewing tools as well, they will show ghosted files. They will show the actual contents of those ghosted files. Some of the problems you run into when you do a forensics analysis, um, when you have a system that is access controlled, you have trouble getting passwords, you have trouble getting the right permissions uh, to use a system. Uh, virus infections are problems with anal analysis. Um, disks that you want to analyze that have been formatted, you know, you, have, you can try recovering some of that, but it is a problem. Corrupted disks are very common. Um, things that have been degaussed, diswiped, uh, defragmented, uh, issues with cluster boundaries, and then you know other tools that are used to hide things like evidence eliminator, and uh, you can actually use Norton utilities and go in and put in you know zeros instead of uh, data in there. I think as most of you know, when you delete a file off of a computer, it does not actually go away. It can eventually be overwritten but all you're doing is replacing the first character um, so that it's no longer readable by the operating system and it can be recovered very easily. Okay, in terms of protecting what you're getting in terms of evidence, um, definitely want to look at the anti-static bags and uh, being able to protect that. You're going to look at you know, the right tape, the right uh, boxes, uh, warning against uh, electromagnetic fields, et cetera. And that's kind of what evidence might look like when you're done with it. <laughs> when you're dealing with network forensics, you're, uh, you're going to be analyzing, well, issues with analyzing packet traces, um, trying to establish a sequ sequence of events and where things might have, have come thr from, and a very challenging goal of identifying the intruder. Some of the tools you may have on this encounter on the systems are sniffers and, uh, and alterations of the system logs. Uh, you can also put sniffers on your system and, and read the logs and do additional logging to try to capture those kinds of things. Uh, some additional issues that you have uh, with network forensics, IP spoofing, uh, hijacking, session hijacking. Uh, password attacks, social engineering, cracking passwords, sniffers that are actually reading your keystrokes or uh, just interpreting what's going across the network. Distributed coordinated attacks and then identify concealed uh, by connection, identity concealed by connection laundering. And that's a lovely picture of uh, potential connection laundering. There's so much out there in the internet that you can still you can move around, you can steal uh, access, you can steal identities, and uh, as we know, not everybody is protected. <laughs> I don't know that there's been any studies to find out what percentage actually have any kind of security in place. Uh, most ISPs, I think, today are making efforts to have some level of security in place, uh, but it's still relatively easy to reach out and steal a connection and uh, take on other uh, connection identity. Again, some more st statistics. Uh, in 2000, it was estimated that there's 108 million email subscribers and 25.2 billion messages that pass daily. Yeah, that's probably reasonable. Um, email is one way at a given time, or it can be one sin multiple ways at a given time. But it's a mechanism that um, people can use that even though their name's on it, might provide them a little bit of a nomin and I can't even say that word, yeah. Hid hidden, hide themselves. <coughs> uh, <laughs> but they also, in an email, you might have a tendency to include more information than you normally would in a conversation. 
and uh, that can oftentimes get, get uh, people in trouble. And then, of course, email spoofing, where you take uh, on somebody else's identity. And yeah, it's relatively easy in an unprotected system to uh, to steal or to spoof an email. Where's the future of forensics? Basically, computer crimes and methods are going to continue to grow. They're going to continue to um, probably exceed what law enforcement and legitimate corporations can keep up with because their full-time job is crime. Technical crime is going to become uh, uh, even more prolific than it is today. So realistically, what the industry is going to have to look at is providing specialists, um, more training, more certification, uh, more experience, uh, more focus on uh, computer forensics, get the right people trained in these kinds of things. Um, you have to do that in both the public and the private sectors. Uh, in the any time you're dealing with legal side, law enforcement has to have the right kind of people to do that. Uh, historically, the guy that can actually turn on the computer is the guy that is becoming the computer expert within um, the law enforcement arena. They're getting better, they're getting more training, uh, but it just takes time and it takes money in order to do that. Uh, but that's definitely got to be in the future focus. Uh, encryption is another critical thing for protection of your data. You know, we all, I think a great number of us have laptops that we carry through airports. And how many stories have you heard where the laptops tops have been stolen, which have, uh, you know, multi-million dollar secrets on it? Those kinds of things, uh, encryption is going to become uh, critical for. And there's always a debate within the encryption arena as to, you know, should there be a master key someplace so that the government, law enforcement, et cetera, can break anybody's code on their laptop. I'm not going to get in that conversation, but that is uh, one of the discussions that has been in there. And the forensics tools, they, they must be automated, especially with the gigabytes of information that are out there. Um, like Kit, we talked about in case coroner's toolkit, they're becoming better and better, um, and they're evolving, but it's just a matter of uh, continuing that evolution and trying to keep up with the technology. And then you have to have search engines that are going to be more robust, um, able to find things better. Uh, Unix tools uh, for forensics, there are a couple out there, but uh, Windows is probably a little further ahead, I think, than the Unix side. That's part of the process, absolutely. And, and basically what the statement is, is why do you have to have tools to do forensics? It's all part of the process, and the tools are just a value added in that process. Um, you, you, yeah, what I'm talking about are, is the commercial products. The statement that was made was um, not using commercial products, but using log files, using native utilities within the operating systems to do those kinds of things. And that is a valuable part of the process, absolutely. Um, the tools, in my opinion, are a value added in that process. So, Okay, and uh, better network analysis tools and tools to analyze and distribute applications and better ways to deal with RAID, uh, the redundant array of independent drives. Uh, we've run across this quite a bit as companies are trying to uh, better manage their systems. RAID forensics, because it breaks the data up between multiple uh, disks, it becomes a challenge. And uh, the native utilities uh, may or may not be able to, to help you with that. So, Okay, and just to conclude, the uh, computer forensics is an integral part of your instant response process. And uh, if there are any questions whatsoever, I would be happy to try to answer them. And if you want to catch me afterwards, after we're done, we've got about uh, 15 minutes or so for questions. 
start with the yellow shirt. The question is, what about the legal or ethical aspects of using things like back orifice to do the forensics? Um, it sounds like a uh, game question from uh, last night. Realistically, if you're using something like that for forensics, again, you've got to be able to back it up uh, in a court of law. and. Do with what we do within JAWS, we don't use those, but I, I can't speak for everybody as to what they can and can't use for that. Um, it was a tool developed by, you know, how do I say this nicely? Um, anyways, we'll leave it at that. Anyways, the, you have to be able to justify the tools you use. Sometimes the, the bad guy's tools can help you as well. But whether the ethical side of it, I can't really address that. The statement that he made was that the tools that you choose, um, you're taking a risk when you use an un untested tool. Um, basically, if if you use a tool like back orifice, uh, you want to set if you want to set the precedent for uh, using that tool and trying to take it to court or whatever. If it works great, then you've set a precedent for other people too. But it, untested things are more difficult to take through the process. But one of the nice things um, about Encase as a, a tool, and I don't work for Encase and we just use their product, um, is it can pull that data out. There's a mechanism within that where you can show all, um, as it does its analysis or does its review of the system, it'll show all that uh, existing things and it'll show whether it's hidden inside. Um, as for other tools that do that, I, I do not know. But um, and the other thing is would be to get S tools itself as you know an, an analysis tool. Well, a, we have a technician or a, a senior forensics technician on our team that has found a way to do that. Um, I I don't know the process. But if you give me your information, I can get him in contact with you. That's a good question. The question is, is there uh, any analysis done on the return on investment of prosecuting a network intruder? And um, I honestly don't know the answer to that question. I, I think in terms of setting, if you are hacked through your network and you are able to determine the methodologies and the how as part of that analysis process to get the get that person prosecuted you're going to find ways to enhance your network security therefore the return on investment is leans back that way as to complete analysis i mean that's that's a, that's a good question very good question anyone else Well, this bit was changed or the 
software did this incorrect? Won't that call in question all of the previous cases? And who's going through and doing this analysis of any of these tools? Because in case, I would assume it's probably proprietary. They have to release the source code and head out again. So how do we? How do you verify or validate that the tools you're using, if they're not open source, actually isn't doing something to the data? And that's a very good question. And the question is, how do you know that the tools that you use aren't doing something to the data, as opposed to you know the the utilities that are on the systems themselves? Where open software versus proprietary software, and that that is a an excellent question. Like I said in toward the beginning of the presentation, it's critical to know the processes of computer forensics, so that when you're talking about that, you're not totally dependent upon the tools. In terms of how the how it's interpreted with the software bugs, those kinds of things, those are things that would have to be brought up and addressed in the court as it comes along. You don't want to hide anything in the court. If you find a known bug, then like I said in the presentation, you want to identify that, okay, there's this known bug which affects this element of this package. And if that's the case, then you're looking at whatever element that's affecting, it may put that type of evidence into question. But as opposed to the whole program being in question or the whole tool, you know, that would have to go through the process. They do have way, the different companies from what I understand, when they run into the software problems, you know, they put out bulletins on what that means, and they work toward resolution of that. You're talking about setting a precedent within a court system. Again, I'm not a legal guy, so it's difficult for me to try to give you a complete answer on that. But in terms of the actual software, as you as a forensics analyst, as long as you know the processes of forensics, what that software is supposed to be doing, and can say that yes, except for this known bug, this software found these kinds of things. You know, generally that known bug is not going to put child pornography into the system. And as long as you can educate the courts in that process, then you've done your due diligence in that, and then the court decides what the answer is. Yeah, I did see that report. And yes, it is. Yeah, and those are excellent points. Yes, they can. Yeah. The question was, does the defense get the opportunity to do examination of the evidence? Yes, they have access to that, and they can choose to do that. Well, that's the whole handling side of it, and that's when the courts would get involved. Okay. I'm sorry. 
Okay. <laughs> Sir. Well, it, it, you get back to the point of access, last access date, last write date, those kinds of things. Once you start the forensics analysis, you never change that. None of these processes are infallible, um, but certainly they give you a better chance for success. That, I mean, that's a good point, and it's all in how you handle it when you go through it. Thank you. <laughs> I'm not going to try to repeat that. Um, but certainly there is some experience in this room, and uh, that's excellent. So, uh, you know, continued conversation would be great. Are there any other questions? Excellent. Thank you very much. Thank you for the interaction.